Thanks for joining us for this look at the best original reporting from KPBS News This Week. I'm Matt Hoffman. Coming up, affordable houses are needed in high demand neighborhoods. We're looking at some underused land in Hillcrest and finding out why it's taking so long to build. Local organizations are marking banned book week and bringing attention to efforts to censor what people can read in public places. And the latest in the KPBS's series on public art. See how a massive mosaic celebrating sea life was created at La Jolla Shores. We're going to start with the ongoing challenge to serve thousands of migrants and asylum seekers passing through San Diego. Border reporter Gustavo Solis says many organizations that are stepping up to help are running out of resources. It's been an incredible challenge. Lindsay Tuslowski is the executive director of Immigrant Defenders, one of a handful of nonprofits helping migrants at a makeshift aid center in San Isidro. She says some migrants end up in the streets of San Diego with nothing and no idea where they even are. You know, they're being dropped, some of them with little more than the clothes on their backs. They um, are, you know, just as you and I were standing here, we had someone come up and say, what is the closest airport? Um, people don't know where they are. The aid camp is run by Casa Familiar and located at the San Isidro Community Park. Migrants there tell harrowing stories of their journey into the U.S. Jose Gregorio Coraspe is a Venezuelan asylum seeker. He says extortion is rampant in Mexico. He says they either had to pay local gangs or die. It was a horrible situation. Now that he's in the U.S., Coraspe plans to reunite with family in Miami and pursue an asylum case in immigration court. 51% of all asylum claims have been denied so far in fiscal year 2023, according to data from immigration court. Coraspe fled Venezuela because of violence and poor economic conditions. He says he wants a better future for his daughters. Border Patrol personnel in San Diego have struggled to deal with an increase in illegal migration in recent weeks. Their solution thus far has been to set up makeshift migrant camps in San Isidro and Jacumba. Immigrant rights activists say the camps are inadequate. Migrants often suffer without enough food, water, or protection from the natural elements. Pedro Rios is an activist with American Friends Service Committee. He says everyone has a legal right to seek asylum in the U.S., even if they enter the country illegally. The U.S. has a responsibility to respond to their asylum claims. And, you know, they are fleeing dangerous situations and untold violence. The Biden administration set up a mobile phone app for asylum seekers to set up appointments and enter the U.S. The app is meant to prevent the kind of chaos we are now seeing in San Diego. But Rio says that the app isn't practical for people who are fleeing for their lives. Like one uh, young mother told me, I can't afford to wait for three weeks in a hotel room in Tijuana. I just can't afford that. Um, another woman told me, I've tried using the CBP-1 app multiple times, and it's been three months of just failing to try to access it. I have no other options but to cross here. Back at the Casa Familiar Aid Center in San Isidro, volunteers work hard to make the best of a difficult situation. You know, these are their first moments in the United States, and so, you know, for San Diego, it's important for us that they remember those moments as someone gave them a helping hand and made sure that they were safe. But money is running short. A spokesperson for Casa Familiar told KPBS that the camp may have to shut down because of lack of funds. Gustavo Solis, KPBS News. This story was reported by KPBS journalists Matt Bowler and Maria Elena Castellanos. A biofuel plant in Barrio Logan's is shelving plans to upgrade a facility that's become a target for complaints. KPBS environment reporter Eric Anderson tells us why some neighbors are encouraged by what might come next. The conflict flared up when the Barrio Logan Company moved their oil processing operation into a building near Sicard Street. Turning used cooking oil into biodiesel fuel is a smelly business, and neighbors began complaining to local air quality regulators. Citations were issued, and the company sealed up the building and installed a charcoal-activated air filter system. Last December, New Leaf's Chris White showed off the expensive new system to regulators a day after it was installed. So this is just exactly as it looked uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, with everything connected and in its proper place, you'll notice that these, this, at the top there's another ring on the carbon vessels, which is the increase in volume. 
Um, and I've just put that white arrow there, so it gives a bit of an idea of scale. Those carbon whistles are 11 feet tall. The vents, fans, and 11-foot-tall carbon filters worked as advertised. The overwhelmingly pungent smells were largely eliminated, but the business still creates an odor. Neighborhood advocates say it's the wrong kind of business for this area. A heavy industrial biodiesel plant in the middle of a residential neighborhood, right? We have single family homes right behind me here, an affordable senior housing complex to my right, and, and a preschool right around the corner. But company officials say they only located their business there because of state and city incentives designed to revitalize the enterprise zone in the Barrio Logan census tract. Company founder Jennifer Case said in a statement that the firms got along with neighbors and won awards from local officials. The statement said to make a positive impact in the world by displacing petroleum diesel, with biodiesel made from recycled cooking oil. The fuel made at new lease facilities is the lowest carbon diesel alternative fuel in the state, 85% better than petroleum. But Case concedes the expansion caused odor issues. The filters helped, but the company suggested building a pipeline under Sicard Street so oil wouldn't have to be moved on trucks. That plan was shelved after the community complained, complaints that Case heard directly at a public meeting in August. For many, many years, for decades, industry has operated in Barrio Logan in a way that's dismissive of community concerns or their quality of life. To be there, to hear and take that input from residents, even if it was uncomfortable, I'm sure it was, uh, for her to hear, um, and then internalize that and take an action in withdrawing the permit, that's a big step. And, and, and it's a step, again, towards the healing, the healing of the neighborhood. New Leaf officials insist they've been good neighbors and were responsive once concerns were raised about the odors. Case of statement says the company only has positive intent for the neighborhood. Quote, in the meantime, we must also consider our thousands of restaurant customers, our ultra-low carbon biodiesel users, and our dedicated team of over 50 employees, unquote company is asking air quality officials and the Environmental Health Coalition to give them some time to make improvements while they find a new place to process cooking oil. Maria Fernanda Corral has lived in a senior apartment complex across the street from the plant for eight years. She says the last three years have been horrible and she wants the plant to move. We know for sure we do not have the 10 years they're asking for and most of us we don't. Uh, so it's a matter, for us, it's a matter of business, money, and probably greed. Corral says she and her husband locked themselves in their apartment during the pandemic in an effort to escape the smell. She says the filters do help. It did get better. You know, we have days that we can leave the uh, windows open. My door is always open when we do have a good day. But then it always comes back, specifically evenings and weekends. Corral and others in the Barrio Senior Villa's apartment complex are suing New Leaf Biofuels. They're asking the courts to award monetary damages and to keep the plant from expanding further. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. Eric Anderson is also one of the guests on our latest KPBS Roundtable episode. New episodes are released every Friday and they feature a discussion with local reporters. This week is all about environmental news and our local water supply. You can stream the show on all major podcast platforms. It also airs on KPBS Fridays at noon. News about our climate had a lot of interest this week over at kpbs.org. The latest numbers show it was a very wet year for San Diego. Read about what that means for wildfire risk in the months ahead. Free is always popular. We have a roundup of some free activities for kids this month all around San Diego County. And checking out the map. Our latest series on public art continues with this trip to La Jolla. It's just steps away from a swing set slide in Jungle Dream. In the background, you hear the laughter of children and the sound of crashing waves. It's another playground of sorts made out of concrete and tile. The map, as it's affectionately called, is a 2,500 square foot mosaic. It sits at the Walter Monk Educational Plaza at La Jolla Shores. This massive piece of public art depicts the Grand Canyons of La Jolla, as well as over 100 species indigenous to California's coast. 
all in hundreds of thousands of pieces of hand cut tile. Making a mosaic of this size is not easy. And it's only possible thanks to the technique called litho mosaic. It was invented by artists Robin Brailsford and Wick Alexander, along with concrete specialists. Well, I tend to be a person who thinks big, and this is a technique that really only works for big. So that kind of, that, you know, fit right in for me. The patented process is a remix of the classic mosaic technique of securing tile to a surface with mortar and grout. Instead, litho mosaic uses monolithic concrete pores. So litho mosaic did two things. It allows us to work super large. Uh, one just went in this week in uh, Tempe, Arizona, that's 750 square feet. Um, and it also has figured out a way through the chemical balance of the concrete and with the techniques that we put into it to allow it to go in in a freeze-thaw environments. So we have it in Alaska, Nevada, New Mexico, places where um, you wouldn't normally be able to have mosaics. Brailsford also works with artists Kelsey Hartley and Mariah Armstrong Connors. She says a new mosaic begins with research. When I have a project or when I have identified a site that I want to do for my own without a public art commission, um, I think of a, I, I study it really hard. I am there, I watch the sunrise, the moon set, whatever. Um, I talk to the people, I research a lot in the libraries, I read a lot of books. All my project proposals have bibliographies, ex bibliographies extensive bibliographies for the research I've done. Brailsford and Alexander's home studio is nestled in the hills of East San Diego County. There, the shelves of books are evidence of that scholarly approach to public art. We're at a funny point now where the house doesn't have very many walls, and all the walls it can have either paintings or bookshelves. <laughs> so, you know, how many more books do we buy um, is the current problem. Once the research is done, the next step is design conception. I do all my litho mosaic layouts. Um, I paint them on clear plastic because I'm basically a glass artist and so I'm most comfortable working in glass. That's why you know things that you're seeing that are older um, are glass. So anyway, I paint on both sides of a piece of, piece of clear plastic like this and I can really get the effect that I want of what the little mosaics are gonna be like. Then the labor intensive work of hand cutting and placing each piece of tile begins. In the litho mosaic process, tiles are secured upside down to mesh with water-based glue. After the layout is complete, it's time to install the mosaic. This is done by concrete professionals. So they take it and they lay it upside down in the monolithic concrete pour, pull off the plastic, and then they trowel it, trowel it, trowel it, and then when the concrete has begun to set a little bit enough to hold the tiles in place, then they peel the mesh back okay. and the tiles are actually there in place and no mesh and no grouting and no buckets and no yeah. backbreaking work on our part. Back at the map, we're able to get a better idea of how the skilled craftsmen install the mosaic. Imagine putting this much tile in your kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what they were doing was that on one, hand, on one end they were troweling this one in, and over here they had the pumper truck and they were up to their ankles, you know, pumping in the concrete and, and leveling it and then bringing over the next one at the same time. And it's uh, the ballet of the highest order of how they put it together. All of this wouldn't be possible without the Walter Monk Foundation for the Oceans. It worked with the city and community stakeholders to bring the mosaic to life. Monk is widely considered to be the father of modern oceanography. He was one of the first scientists to bring statistical methods to the analysis of oceanographic data. And while he died in 2019 before the map was finished, the mosaic continues his legacy of teaching the next generation about the oceans and the animals that call it home. And the beauty of public art is that it's for everyone. Well, I was just talking to uh, one of my collaborators, Kelsey Hartley, on the phone, and she was pointing out that in this uh, time right now, mortgages are expensive, COVID has left people without jobs. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. And what's great about public art and something like this is you can really sort of interact and own it, you know, on your own. Um, I love the fact that my things don't belong to anybody and, and, and they belong to everybody. And you can be here at midnight, you can be here at three o'clock in the morning, you can be homeless, you can have the biggest house in La Jolla and you all get to experience it at the same, in the same way. From a 31-foot gray whale to a life-size human diver, the map offers visitors a chance to explore the ocean, but without having to get wet. You know, there you go. That's what more could I ask for? Brendan Tucinardi, KPBS News.
To see some more public art stories and tell us what pieces we should cover next, go to kpbs.org slash public art. La Jolla Playhouse recently held the world premiere of Sumo. The play takes you into its, inside of an elite sumo training facility in Tokyo. KPBS arts reporter Beth Akamondo went behind the scenes for a rehearsal to learn more about this traditional Japanese sport. Sumo is a battle of giants with its origin dating back some 2,000 years. It comes from mythology, right, of Shinto mythology of the gods. James Yagashi serves as the cultural and martial arts advisor for La Jolla Playhouse's Sumo. Oh. There's tremendous ritual involved, many Shinto rituals. Additionally, these were uh, men, you know, back in the, you know, 1600s, where society was still very much a, a feudal and warrior society. People would carry swords regularly. And so a lot of the rituals that we see in the dohyo, which is the ring, are abstractions of basically showing the opponent that you are unarmed which is, of course, why they only have a basically a mawashi, which is a glorified loincloth, so to speak. And they're naked otherwise, and they, they spread their arms, they show that they've got nothing, and it's just a sheer competition of, of strength. And Japanese-American playwright Lisa Sanae Dring fell in love with sumo. I was so entranced by the idea or the feeling of a sport being so powerful and so ferocious and so wild and then also so restrained and so filled with ceremony and honor. That sense of ritual is even apparent in the rehearsal room. This is a universe where we bow before we go into the rehearsal room, everybody, and we take our shoes off for, you know, there's a part of the stage we can't wear shoes in because it's where they fight, but also it's very Japanese to take your shoes off when you enter a space. You know, we're a mixed cultural room. We have a taiko drummer who provides this wonderful sort of like soundscape with the movements that we're doing. Movements that the cast had to learn. So I wanted to make sure that, that the actors got plenty of time to get familiar with, you know, living in their lower half of their body. In warm-ups before rehearsal, we've spent a lot of time on um, the kind of exercises that the sumo wrestlers actually do. <laughs> Sometimes there's a ton, like a literal ton of power when you like do the math on like two bodies hitting each other like that, that's there. And so that is hopefully what we are portraying to the audience, of like how strong these men are. Sanae Dring wanted to create a space where Asian men could lead with strength and where the topic would not be racism or victimization. And so in this play, it leads with, oh, that's not the conversation here. We are not having to prove our masculinity, the men on stage and the people on stage are not having to prove their masculinity because it's not challenged, which I feel like in many conversations in the theater right now, whiteness is uh, assaulting some parts of Asianness. The sumo ring is an omnipresent reminder of what's driving the characters in the play. I wanted to tell the story of someone who is rising to power inside of a structured hierarchy, who is also challenging that hierarchy, and then is also so changed by the system which he is in that he doesn't know who he is at the end of it. So it's like, what is it to completely revolutionize your mindset from being an entity unto oneself into a part of this machine? And that's also Japanese culture as well. Which is why Yagashi's knowledge of sumo was key. First and foremost, I, I'm interested in, in trying to capture sort of iconic images of what we see as sumo. But then in addition to that, there's sort of the theatrical element of how do we then make these images, these rituals or movements interesting in a theatrical setting. You know, it's not a bar fight. A sumo wrestling match is not that. And so I think in any sport, there looks like a dance involved, even if it's a dance of besting one another. Audiences do not need to know anything about sumo before coming to the play, but they might leave with a greater appreciation of an ancient Japanese sport. The primary intention is not to teach people about the sport. It is to illuminate humanity inside of the sport. Sanae Drang takes us inside the world of sumo to create a powerful image of Asian men that we do not often see on the American stage. Beth Akamondo, KPBS News.
One of the themes in our recent Democracy Day coverage is the effort to ban certain books inside of libraries and schools. It's happening across the country, including here in San Diego. Tanya Thorne tells us how some local activists are bringing attention to the issue during Banned Books Week. The American Library Association reports seeing a surge in book censorship attempts in recent years. So they have declared the first week of October as Banned Books Week. Libraries and organizations throughout San Diego will be holding events to educate the community about book censorship. Like Renee Tarver with the North San Diego County Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. This is a social action issue all over the country and people don't seem to understand the, the gravity of the situation. She says many of the books being challenged aim to erase uncomfortable but important American history. Eventually, there will be no history except what people tell us happened that didn't happen. The sorority will be hosting virtual events throughout the week on book censorship. What banned books are about, what options people have to, um, to fight the censorship, because you can fight censorship. So we're, we're doing that um, because the opposition to this is a well-organized machine um, and we've been reactionary. So we want to not be reactionary. We want educated community and we want the community to know how they can fight back. Californians could be seeing less book censorship after Governor Gavin Newsom signed a bill that forbids book bans in schools. It also prohibits school boards from banning instructional materials based on racial or LGBTQ plus topics. But how that plays out has yet to be determined because just last week, Escondido Union School District closed all of their libraries for a book audit. In a statement, Superintendent Luis Ibarra said, the district has temporarily suspended library services to allow our library media technicians to conduct a thorough audit of our library collection. He stated that a book containing sexually explicit material was in one of the school libraries. The title of the book, found in one of the K-8 schools, was not provided. More details will be released following the audit that could keep libraries closed until the end of this week. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. It's three acres of state-owned land in one of San Diego's most walkable neighborhoods, and most of the time, it's an empty parking lot. Metro reporter Andrew Bowen explains why little progress has been made to redevelop the site and bring some new housing to the area. So you can see we have a lovely car dealership here. It's one of probably at least five or six in this stretch of three blocks. Um, Jeevan Coley is showing me around his neighborhood of Grantville. We've got some fast food right there, uh, some unmarked buildings that I still don't know what they contain. He landed here eight years ago as a graduate student. This is the neighborhood he could afford, but he's not in love with it. It's not particularly hip around here. There's not a lot to do. Uh, and I'd really like to be able to walk to interesting places rather than getting in my car and, and driving there. And so Hillcrest has a lot of great restaurants, cafes. Hillcrest is also close to Balboa Park, where Coley likes to go running. And it's the heart of San Diego's LGBTQ community. Uh, for people who have queer identity, I think being in a space that feels so openly welcoming and accepting really can change your quality of life. Coley isn't living off a graduate student stipend anymore. He's a full-time researcher in the UCSD Neurosciences Department. But Hillcrest is still out of reach. Yeah, you know, I've kept my eye on kind of the prices on the apartments around there, and it's really only gotten worse. DMV property is, is probably one of the finest sites possible for affordable housing, uh, in not just in Hillcrest, but in the city. Stephen Russell is executive director of the San Diego Housing Federation and a resident of Hillcrest. We meet at the 63-year-old Hillcrest DMV. The building isn't very big, but the property is just about three acres, mostly a surface parking lot with crumbling asphalt. I think they've given up on it. They've, they've intended to, to replace this facility for so long that they're not even doing basic upkeep anymore. Russell says the property is surrounded by dense housing and the neighborhood needs more of it for all income levels. 
you know, folks who are uh, getting the high paid jobs in the tech sector, who want all the lifestyle uh, qualities that Hillcrest brings, are willing to pay even if the apartment is perhaps an older, uh, you know, an older uh, functionally obsolete building. But given the choice, they, they would many times choose to live in something newer with more amenities and leave that unit on the market for, perhaps for someone who is lower income. The state knows this property needs replacement. One effort to build a mixed-use project here fell apart in 2012. Then, in 2018, the DMV proposed a project with no housing and a seven-foot-tall wrought iron fence around the perimeter. The proposal was universally panned, and the DMV was told to start over and create a project with housing. Um, you need to have a DMV facility somewhere here in central San Diego, and this still makes sense for that purpose. Chris Ward represents Hillcrest in the state assembly. He met with the DMV last year and says they promised to assess what they need in a new facility. Many of their services have moved online, so maybe they could get by with a smaller footprint. But he checked in last month, and that assessment is still in the works. And I just don't feel like a lot has been done over the last year, um, certainly not to my satisfaction. So I do intend to up my levels of communication and really press this. And if this comes in the form of legislation that needs to be introduced in January when I get back to Sacramento, so be it. I hope that we're not going to wait another five or ten years to see the right program for this site eventually move forward. But I'm here in my time as the state assembly member for this district uh, to be able to help uh, uh, support support um, the evolution of this site and certainly be uh, something that's more multi-purpose in nature. And I had always kind of hoped that I could eventually make my way over to somewhere like Hillcrest. Jeevan Coley says he hopes the state government can just cut through the bureaucracy and get it done. You know, people in San Diego need affordable housing. People outside of San Diego who would like to live here need affordable housing. And so uh, having that space and just kind of sitting on that is a really unfortunate missed opportunity. And it would be nice if uh, we could utilize that in, in one way or another. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. You can also find our stories on the KPBS YouTube page. Subscribe there and get notifications for new content that gets posted daily. That's where we also have the latest with Evening Edition weeknights at 5 p.m. We hope you enjoyed this look at KPBS News this week. I'm Matt Hoffman. Thanks for joining us.